I've always believed that global success can be achieved from any pocket of the world. Being here in rural Cape Breton throughout the pandemic has proven this, not just for myself, but for entrepreneurs everywhere who've adapted and found opportunities in spite of significant challenges. So many people have inspired me throughout my career and continue to every day, from small business owners to international leaders. People across our country are taking risks and betting on themselves in pursuit of their passions. I'm launching these platforms to spark conversations about what it takes to succeed in business and life. If you want to stay connected and inspired, follow along. Today, I'm going to be speaking with one of the most innovative women that I've had the pleasure of working with, Dr. Beth Mason. Beth has an impressive career and education path that started in Edinburgh, Scotland, with her BSc in Agriculture, then her Master's and PhD via Alberta and British Columbia, and ultimately leading her to her current position as a CEO of the Vershuren Centre. Beth is originally from the UK, but calls Cape Breton her home now. Her passion for sustainable solutions for global problems and creating novel ways to support and grow innovative companies has taken her through a mix of careers. Today, her mission is to accelerate the uptake of clean technologies to rapidly transform traditional manufacturing. New technologies are utilizing our primary resources and replacing petro-based products in all aspects of our lives linking traditional industry with global demand for naturally derived alternatives. Creating profit through clean technology commercialization is what puts her on the map. Dr. Mason is smart, brave, and full of promise, and continues to make moves forward in supporting innovative clean technology commercialization. Hey, Beth. Hey, Annette. So good to see you here with me in the Vershoren Center. Isn't it cool? It is cool yeah. that you're what, here. What a journey it's been. We're so lucky to have you come to our country. <laughs> My God. Uh, so, Beth Mason, um, so uh, nice to be on this podcast, Bet on Me. So, Beth, how, tell us a little bit about your background. Tell us a little bit about how the journey about how you got here, because I think it's a very cool journey. How did I get? It was actually quite a funny story. Yeah. Um, so I was actually working for Saputo, as you know, um, doing everything under the sun with their way byproducts to try and pull value out, which is the kind of story of my life. It's like take everything that nobody else wants and see if we can make something of it, right? Yeah. And uh, so you've always been working with waste. <laughs> you know, shit and pretty gut, much fish from guts pig and poop things like that. to to whey to yep. fish guts to yep. you know you're natural. Everything. I am. <laughs> I live in the waste. <laughs> and so, uh, one of the things we were trying to do is to grow something in the in the whey permeate because they've taken the protein value out. And so it's like, oh, so I got all the sugar with no protein. How can I make protein back in it? So I was growing things in it. Yeah. So this was whey. This, this was, was way so this was the yeah. this was the byproducts of, of cheese of, of cheese yeah. okay yeah. and and so the cheese is a long story yeah. in my life and apparently I don't eat anything but cheese yes. when people come to visit they look in the fridge and go do you have anything other than dairy <laughs> anyway so it makes me a little self conscious about cheese and and one of the things we were going to grow in it was algae and so I was at an algal biomass conference in the states yeah. And I met my predecessor who was working with an algae company. And I said, hey, I've got a great substrate for you. And that was when I came up then to talk at the, at the Atlantic Biocon about waste and wow. how you can make money from it. So. And then you decided and to come And then I here. met you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and some of your colleagues, some of the board actually yeah. at the time of the yeah. VC at a dinner. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, like, there's so much potential here and there's so much will to do it in that group. Little did I know what happened outside the rest of the world, but it was just like, this is the chance to do it. And so some of the crazy things that I think even Saputo didn't know I was working on in the energy side, in terms of bioenergy, 
I thought, oh, we'll just do it here. Yeah. So I came up with some crazy scheme whereby I still worked for them, but I worked here as well. Yeah. And that's where it began. On I the love this story. <laughs> Let's go back. Tell, tell us where, where your roots are. Because uh, I thought you came, you come from a mining community like, like I have. Uh, I you? come from the north of England. And at the time I left the UK, there was 25% unemployment in the north of England. Wow. And everybody was on strike. Yep. Um, so it was a coal. Yep. Our, our, our old high school actually had old coal mines underneath. And apparently there was a big scare one day and we all got sent home it because sunk. they thought it was going to sink into one of the, yep. the mines. But it was largely a, a cotton um, mill. Oh, place. really? Okay. So yeah, we were at the end of the Industrial Revolution. Revolution. So I, I was thinking about that, actually. You're not I'm, that old. <laughs> I am. No, you're but, not. And that, this is my worry. You're going <laughs> to age me with these questions. Because I remember I used to walk over the moors with my father and we would look across. Lancashire was the county I was from and it would be uh, chimney stacks. And as a little kid, uh, some days we had to go to school with a mask on like we are now, yeah. but because of the smog from the smoke particles. Really? And over the years, all of those chimneys disappeared. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's the, where I came so from. So we had a climate crisis during the Industrial Revolution, we did. didn't we? We and now, did. Now the, we've come full circle. Absolutely. And, and it's happening again. And it was so obvious there yeah. because the, the, the ha a lot of the houses are red brick, yeah. but they would look dark red. And, this, and the stone ones looked black. Yeah. And it was only like once the mills all disappeared, people start sandblasting the, the buildings. It's like, oh, crikey, it's stone. Yeah. Like, you know, kind of beige colored stone instead yeah. of like black uh, when, from all the soot over the years. Beth, when I was a kid, my mother would uh, put her white sheets outside and dry them yeah. and they would be red. Yeah. Because the smoke would change from where the steel plant was co was, yeah. was coming and the and yeah. the sheets would be red. Yeah. As so we were breathing all of this stuff. Oh, I know. It's quite amazing, huh? It like is. It, thank it God is. it's changed. But yeah. so so why did you leave that community? How old were you when you left? As soon as I could. Yeah. Um I mean it sounds awful, but really I think as a kid all I ever tried to do was get away. Yeah. And it <laughs> And it was, I, I loved the moors. I used yeah. to get on my bike and ride as far as I could yeah. um, there. And um, when it came to go to university, well, actually, I was going to go to ag college. And my father said, no, you're not. <laughs> and so you're going to university. So I thought, well, I'll pick ones that are as far away as I can get. So it was either London or Edinburgh. And I went to Edinburgh because when I went to visit, I, I could see, I could walk, uh, ride out my bike along the Pentland Hills. Cool. And so that's, that was my first getaway. Yeah. So it was basically as far as I could within the UK. And then... What, did uh, you, what degree did you take at Edinburgh? Agriculture. Agriculture. Yeah. Was this a science degree? It was BSc. Okay. Yeah, general yeah. Ag. Okay. Was so it in biodiversity? I was, well, I was going to... I was going to do animal science because yeah. that, that's been my, my love is, is animals. Yeah. Um, I was just say if I could have an, a desert island with just animals and no people, <laughs> yeah. I would be good. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but so I was going to do animal science and I, th and, and I thought, no, I've got to stay wide enough. Yeah. I've never wanted to be pigeonholed. Yeah. Uh, I can't be contained yeah. to one thing. Yeah. My brain just is interested in too many things. You're curious. <laughs> yeah. So, and, so, and so I did general ag. So we had to do things like tractor mechanics okay. and potato production. Yeah. So remember this, this prof who taught us pa potato production. I missed all his classes because I couldn't understand a word he said <laughs> in such a strong Scottish accent. <laughs> That's great. So, so yeah. So, so let's, I want to keep going because I, will, I want to get you here. How did you get to Canada? So at the end of my bachelor's, um, I wanted to get even further away. <laughs> so I, I picked New Zealand, Australia, and Canada, because I figure I'll go to an English speaking place because I'm not good at English, so <laughs> I'm sure as heck not good at foreign languages. So I'll, I'll pick someone <laughs> that's friendly and they might understand me, right? Um, and so those were the three. And then it just happened that one of the profs that we used to go drinking with, he said, uh, Hey, I know some guy at, at, at um, Edmonton at U of A. Uh, why don't you contact him? And so I did, because I, I, it was just, like I said, don't be pigeonholed. Everybody else up there either came from a dairy farm yep. or, or arable. Yep. And so I thought, oh, well, I'm not going to do the same as everybody else. I'll study pigs. Yep. 
And so I did. And so that was the connection that U of A was with the pig nutrition group. So, so I wrote to them and I said, hey, can I come? And then about a week before I was supposed to start, I get a letter saying, yeah, sure, come along, come on down. So, so I, I was thinking this too early. I was like, the first time I ever got on an airplane was to fly to Canada. Wow. I had never been on a plane before. Wow. wow. Isn't that crazy? That's cool. That's a yeah. cool story. Do you know that my parents had a choice of Canada, New Zealand, and Australia? Yeah. And they chose Canada too. Yeah. What a cool story. So you got to uni University of Alberta. Yeah. Uh, you got your master's degree and your PhD. What did you did. get your PhD in? Well, I never wanted to do a PhD. Of that was not. another funny oh, thing because, yes, yes. like I said, I didn't want to be narrowed. Yeah. Like I've had this resistance to being specialized in something. I'm a general, you know, jack or jill of all trades. And so um, I did my master's and then I was really, for some crazy reason, I was really into, into simulation modeling. Don't ask me yeah. why. Yeah. And, and there was another crazy uh, supervisor from Australia, and he said, oh, you can do that with me, because he was also a little off the wall. And, uh, and he did crazy things, like he was allergic to bee stings, so he'd go and surround himself with bees and get stung as many times as he could in the hopes he built up some kind of immunity to it, right? So I'm like, okay, that, he'll be a good one to do. And so he said, well, I want you to do the simulation work, but I can't fund you unless you do a PhD. Yeah. And yeah. so I was like, oh, what the heck? So I did one. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, so that was that was. So you did that. What did you do next? I went to work in the feed industry. Okay. Yeah. So I went to work with a small company that did uh, premixes for all species. Okay. And that was in Alberta. Yeah. And that lasted about a year and a half. And it's like, okay, done that. Yeah. <laughs> and then I and then I went to work for the Ministry of Agriculture because it was a little bit naive back then. Yeah. Um. <laughs> like I still am and and it was kind of like well it's okay it's government I realize that but I'll be able to do things I'll be able to make a difference yeah, that's right, right. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> I didn't realize at the time people had like one of those hockey pools and were taking bets on, on how, how long, long I was going to last in government how long did you last <laughs> just over a year <laughs> well, that was longer than I would have expected it, it, it was it <laughs> almost killed me so what next what happened next well, the funny thing was, uh, while I was doing that job, I met my husband, mm -hmm. who had a pig farm. And this is one of those. I had always said, I will never farm. Yep. I wanted to help producers to, well, you know, to do better. Do, yeah, yeah and, and, and not be the one farming. Even though I love it, I could see that that was going to be challenging. And then, lo and behold, I meet my husband. And for some crazy reason, he owned a pig farm. Like, he'd been in businesses, all, all kinds of different business. Like... And for some reason, he went and bought a pig farm. So, yeah, so I met him. And so I left that job, worked the farm, and started a consulting yeah. um, company yeah. doing nutrition advice. So then, and then, you had a couple of children. We did. Yes. Yeah, we yeah. produced two wonderful little sprogs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah. And uh, a boy and a girl, Matthew yeah. and Becky. Yep. Yeah. Um, and they're still you know, in Canada? They are. Yeah. Matty almost went back to the UK. So yeah. we, we went on this marathon tour um, a few years. Oh, it's got to be more yeah. than a few years back. Because he, he just was drawn back there, yep. you know. And so we got in the car over there and we went to just about every university because yeah. we wanted to do engineering, right? And we went, drove the whole length of the country looking at, at universities to, to go yeah. to. Um, but he decided to stay. And, and in the end, the crazy thing is he has British citizenship because he yep. did his, his schooling here. He would be a foreign student right. and pay twice as much. Okay. And so he stayed, thankfully. Okay. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's yeah. great. And your daughter is? My daughter's still on the West Coast. Coast yeah. so, so we had the, cr the Coast, crazy pig coastal farm. people. Yeah, you stayed on the water. We, we do. We're drawn to the ocean. <laughs> uh, as I, I'm told it's called the ocean, not the sea. Every time I say, let's go in the sea, it's like, what? It's an ocean. Um, and, so, and so, yeah, we, we moved off the farm. Yep. Um, we were going to move to Australia. And so it had always been in my heart to go to Australia. And so with the kids when they were little and it was okay to take them out of school, we rented one of those you drive jobbies yep. and drove all over Australia and then New Zealand, both islands. Yeah, yeah, we were ready to kill the children after about day two. Because they'd sleep in this little top thing and they'd just fight like crazy, right? Um, but we, we were going to move there and then my husband uh, got sick. Um, 
And so that canceled that plan. Yeah. And so from Sydney, Australia, yeah. it was kind of like, oh, Sydney, Cape Breton will do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but in between, we moved to, to Salt Spring Island to have somewhere nice for him to be yeah. and safe for the kids to grow up. And, and it was great for the kids. Yeah. It was a great place. So I worked across Canada and the US yeah. from Salt Spring Island, which is so I, we had our own business. Yep. We started this uh, on top of the farm, yep. started a, a logistics business dealing with byproducts. Again, <laughs> everything that nobody else wanted. Yep. So all food uh, manufacturing byproducts. So a brewery waste, whey, yep. uh, everything actually. Uh, I used to say we, we take everything but the kitchen sink, but one day we had this delivery of, of product <laughs> and there was a stainless steel kitchen sink in it. So we actually did take everything with the kitchen sink. So yeah, we started that business, and then I ran that from, from, the, from the island, the other island, um, while I uh, yeah. was working with Saputo across the country. So. And I was on the board, I'm on the board of Saputo. Uh, I know. So a really interesting connection, and yeah. I'll never forget the first day I met you. It was up in the lab, um, and you were grinding uh, shellfish. <laughs> Uh, and adding sugar to it and fermenting it, and I'm there trying to figure out what in the hell you're doing. Um, and, you know, again, you're dealing with byproducts, and you want to make something out of this. And, and that was the first time we met. Uh, and then, you know, yeah. to, the, to the earlier discussion, and then we got you in front of the board, and, yeah. and I never met a person that could... You never got stumped on any question that any of the board members, of course, you're always over our heads, but we really tried to understand <laughs> what you were doing and talking about. Uh, so when did, you, when did you become the CEO of the Versurin Center? What year was that? Three and a half Three and years a half back. years ago. Yeah, so I came six and a half years, years ago. ago. So, yeah. I was probably just over two into supposedly doing the bioproducts. Yep and then to and come CEO. That's right. And yeah. you, you did the CEO and the bioproducts for many, I, many years. I, did. I think you finally yeah. find, found someone to help you with the bioproducts. <laughs> but uh, it's, such, it's such a great story. And so the Versurin Center, you know, why did it start? And, and I was obviously intimately involved in this. Um, you know, it was around 2008, 2009, when yeah. uh, the financial crisis was happening. And I was advising the federal government at the time on what needed to be done to create jobs yeah. because we needed infrastructure. Yeah. And so this was an idea. And the idea was a lot of it had to do with mine reclamation, water management, yeah. et cetera. Very environmentally focused, right? Mm -hmm. And we really worked hard to, um, uh, to create something that uh, added value and we wanted to create jobs in Cape Breton and and I'll tell you the early years were very difficult they mm -hmm. really were um, you know you started six and a half years ago but ten years ago it was a journey <laughs> it yeah. really was yeah. and uh, and you know we built this building and we designed programs and projects and but we weren't quite clear mm -hmm. right on where we wanted to go and what I and I think this journey has been really interesting for for all of us. Um, I love where it is now because it is all about taking waste, taking natural resources, taking waste, adding value to them, yeah. and creating jobs. And and what's really neat about this place, it is, it is, it is quite far down in the commercialization. You know. What I love about you, Beth, you and I really agreed that there was a lot of research being done in our country, mm. but very little being commercialized. Yep. And that was, that was why we built this, thing, mm. right? And, and look what you have done with it. And I would love just to take a few minutes to talk about mm. and help people understand the things that you're doing here. Yeah. So could you sort of take, take a few minutes and, and, and tell us in you know, in layman's terms, as much as you can. I know that's not easy for you. I feel like I speak, people speak, yes. just apparently I don't. <laughs> not all the time. But try to help us understand what happens in this great yeah. facility. Well, first I think you were, as always, ahead of your time. I think when you envisaged this building, nobody else actually got your vision. No. Right? <laughs> that's true. And, and I never actually checked whether I did either, but it was kind of like, we're going to do this anyway. Um, because as you said, 
typically buildings get built and they have an academic focus. And, and to your point, we know statistically, it's quite clear, Canada does not commercialize IP the way it should do. And I think that <clears throat> your vision um, was that, that, okay, we had the mines, we had all that, now where's the, where is the bar? Where is the globe going next? Uh, you know, and, and to use one of the, your phrases, sticks in my head, don't look in the rear view, look at where we need to be. But what happened initially was there was a struggle to kind of figure out, well, here we are in the mines and, and we've had remediation and we need to do something. But there wasn't that, that vision of, well, what will we do? And now in that time period, the speed of acceleration of technology and the tools to do things has, has just been phenomenal. So, you know, fast forward a few years of like, we don't really know what we're supposed to do, but we really love to be doing this. And now it's like, there's the tools. Now, put those into practice and let's get into tomorrow's blue economy, green economy, right? So the other piece of that puzzle is, we have lots of universities with ideas yep. and IP sitting on the shelf, and we have some incubators for startups, yep. right? So those are great, but those aren't necessarily yep. connected. Yep. And we have some accelerators. So you, you go from big numbers of universities and IP, large numbers of incubators, few less accelerators, and then there's nothing. Yep. There's nothing to get those businesses with those ideas that have got proof of concept, that have identified who's buying, which is one of the biggest questions that most innovators don't ask. They I've don't. got a brilliant widget, but Where's I don't know market? who wants what it. Is the but isn't it cool, yeah. right? Um, and there isn't that space to go here. Here, we're going to grow you to commercialization. Yep. And so, and that was clear to me from having had a business. Yep. The loneliest part of business is that phase yep where I've got my idea, I know I want to do it, I don't have any money, yep. um, and, but I've still got to keep going. And that's kind of usually the phase where you, you, you're trying to, you know, scrounge money off the relatives. I remember when we built our logistics business, it was like, you know, my friend's money and my dad's money and, and, and you know, all, all of those things. And, and, and these companies are there, but these companies that need to target the, the next global revolution in, in how to replace all things petrochemical in your life, which yep. is almost everything, everything we touch yep. here will everything be we're sitting on. derived from petrochemicals. All the clothes we're wearing, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Fabrics and, and you know, coatings and yep. plastics and all of those things yep. now have to be replaced. They have to come from natural products. By natural products. Yeah. And, and so the obvious place to do that in, is in a place where there's an abundance of natural, natural products. Products. And that applies on the energy side too. It does. Right? Yes. So, not only do we have to transform energy, we have to transform manufacturing. Yeah. So all of these, all of those brilliant ideas have been stewing yeah. with the new technologies like synthetic biology to actually take a bug and go, I need polymer X, genetically yeah. engineer it, and it yeah. spits it out. Yeah. So we grow it in a big reactor, which is what we built yep. here. Yep. Uh, and then you can produce it, you can purify it, and now you can, you can then provide those manufacturers with the alternative ingredients. Yep. There's no way as manufacturers and large corps that, that we're going to invent those things, yep. grow them in the mothership. Yep. Large, Not gonna large Not gonna multinationals work. buy up IP, buy up small companies, and they die. Yep. Because the mothership can't incubate. That's them. right. It's designed for, and I, and I remember this with some of my ideas in Saputo, I was told, we make cheese. Yep, I we know. don't do that. But you know what? Because you're good at making yep, cheese, you stick right. with making cheese, right? But, but we just acquired a company in, your, in, in the UK that produces vegan cheese. Tastes like, looks yep. like, but it's made out yeah. of vegetables. And so, to your point, yep. companies are buying those. Uh, you uh, have to. You have and, to. And the further along the maturation stage, no pun intended, on, yeah. the, on the mature cheese, they are the greater chance that that technology is uptake in the industry yep. and actually implemented properly. Yeah, exactly. Because you need to know how it works in, in the old yep. system. Exactly. So to your point, you know, one of the products coming off uh, one of the companies here is a flavoring that, that makes veggie burgers taste like meat burgers. Yeah. 
right? Yep. And you can do all that yep. from from so so the key from a of, fermentation process. Yeah. So the so the key to what we can do here it, that's not really being done very many other places that we're not good at in Canada. Yeah is to say, here are the big tools, the capital intensive tools for you to grow to market. Yes, but, but what you're good at, Beth, you're a businesswoman too. And, and not all PhD with science backgrounds are business people. You have the ability to connect the traditional industry mm -hmm. to the new technology, to the new clean tech, yeah. bio, uh, you know, uh, biodiversity uh, opportunities. Yeah. And that, to me, I think, you know, I'm trying to do the same thing at SDTC, at Mars, yeah. where I chair both those, all, the, both those divisions. Yeah. But you, you have it naturally. You are connecting um, companies that need to have sol problems solved yeah. and working with great startups mm. to accelerate and commercialize that product yeah. here. Yeah. Because you know you know, you've known ahead of time more than anybody that these are the facilities, these are the labs that you need yeah. to help these companies grow. Yeah, and I think to your point, you know, um, it, it's about matching the innovators with the uptake. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. so, so all the new technology and product yeah. that the manufacturers need, but getting it to a yeah. stage where you can take the product, yeah. you, you don't need to kill the innovation. Exactly. Right, and exactly. and that doesn't exist in many places. Yeah. And I think that it's uh, this is key for Nova Scotia in particular, yeah. and for Canada, is people work in little silos. Yeah. When I first came, all all I could see is like, oh my gosh, there's a million groups that say they're doing these things, but I'm not. I'm just seeing talk. Yeah. And now what we're seeing is those guys are working together to build that pipeline. Yeah. So where there was a cliff for companies to fall off. Yep. you know, which we call the valley of death, yep. typically, where you didn't have enough money to keep going, you don't have the capital to get the scale up equipment. Now we're going to put that in that gap yep. and we're providing the technology platform for those companies to flow through and also connecting them yep. with the manufacturing sector. Yep. Um, and, and so you've got the pipeline I, to now absolutely. get that innovation into the marketplace. And, and you have the alignment. Yeah. Right. Finally, the governments are aligned. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, the Supreme Court de decision made the the uh, carbon carbon pricing constitutional. Yeah. What a what a what a uh, yeah. you know what a great move. And you know, yesterday I was talking to our new premier, um, Ian Rankin, and he talked to me uh, exactly about biodiversity. He understands that mm -hmm. we need to take our resources and add value to them. Yeah. And and so I. I'd love to talk about some examples. Okay, mm -hmm. let's let's take some let's take some uh, examples in the fishing industry. What are the things that we can do? We can build here. What types of companies can we build so that people can understand what can happen here yeah. through the science? Uh, I, it's a, we'll use it as an example yeah. of where what I call that that third party venture yeah. fills the gap between primary production, which we have, yeah. you know, traditional lots industries, of, lots of and higher value yes. manufacturing, right? So on, on the fish waste, yeah. there, as you say, there's 50% of, of what is caught in processing it's is, thrown is out. unusable yeah. for food. Yeah. Heads, frames, guts, all those things, all the things nobody else wants. Yeah. If you fish ferment guts those, to gold. Yeah. Fish guts to gold. To gold. You ferment those, there's peptides that, that we can pull out by all the new technologies that we have, membrane yeah. technologies, fermentation, that, that are antioxidants. One yeah. of the biggest health issues in terms of wellness that we have as a population, and we're typical of, of developed countries, is, is what I call metabolic syndrome. Most of us are actually sick yeah. because our microflora, which we didn't realize uh, sustains us, yeah. Is, is out of balance because we're not eating fermented foods. We're not eating the, the natural ingredients. We're eating processed, refined, et cetera, et cetera. We're not eating the raw, no, the, enough no, of the raw stuff. No, not the stuff. diet that, that your parents yeah. and my parents would have had yeah, right. when they came, yeah, right? Exactly. Um, I mean, we didn't have fridges, people no. fermented food. Oot, yeah. Those microbes are what brings Oot. us a healthy gut and, yeah. and, and over 60% of your immune function 
is in your so, guts. So, so how, both how peptides. Does, so how does the how does the fish guts and all this? What what can we do guts with the that? guts? Tell tell me what what do, what can we make out of them? So antioxidant peptides. Okay. So a lot of what we consume and are exposed to uh, causes oxidative damage to tissues. So these are nutritious pharmaceutical they are. products. They are. That's what they are. So okay. so. So, you know, my focus going forward is, is twofold. One is food actually becomes a wellness vehicle. Yes, yes. So where you have an antioxidant peptide, instead of us all popping pills, I need an antioxidant, I need yeah. an omega-3, I need this one. Oh, man, I forgot my tablets this morning. Yeah. It, it is embedded. So just as we have vitamin D supplemented milk, yeah. we can use things like dairy products, bread, you know, all those core uh, food ingredients as a vehicle for wellness. So it's added to, to th that product? Yeah, yep. so you can incorporate antioxidants. We do already, we tend to use vitamin E, vitamin C, yep. you know, those kinds of, the peptides do the same thing. So going from marine waste yep. to natural ingredients that provide those same yep. capabilities of bringing health to people yep. by embedding it in our, our routine food ingredients is going to you know change the focus because we've got to get away f it, it's all the preventive health yep, right exactly. instead of fixing yeah. people when they're sick yeah let's stop let's ourselves from getting be sick, proactive right? i think that's great so so i mean the, the omega threes is a great story omega -3, that's yeah. another one right yeah. so so all that that um fish so waste me, has high oil what can we do then with forestry product, give me another example. Yeah. What can we make out of uh, same process? Same process. Same process. So we so ferment. You can take, the, yeah. You can take biomass. You can thermochemically transform it. Yeah. So heat and temperature. Yeah. Um, into all kinds of different carbon products. Okay. So so one of the companies is making a biographene by that thermochemical transformation. Yeah. That biographene is is in tiny amounts brings super strength to concrete. But it also replaces a chunk of cement, which has a horrendous GHE footprint, yes. right? So, so it's, it, there's a lot of dual action in, in the new products. Yep. They're not just replacing a, an ingredient or a component. Yeah. They're bringing additional qualities and to that manufacturing it's process. It's about taking the carbon, right? Yeah. And producing something out of it, yep. graphene and graphite. It, and all we're doing is the same as, as, as you did yeah. you know, the last 10 years with energy. Yeah. Yeah. You take those new technologies, yeah. which they're not tested yet, no. but you put them in a real world situation, you know, drop in the grid yeah. or you, you know, an independent power wall. We do the same thing. We drop this into an existing manufacturer and yeah. go, oh my gosh, look, it works. Yeah. And now, I mean, look at the, the transformation in energy. You, you know, you've gone from testing all of those primary technologies yeah. of companies, and now they're full, yeah. not just commercial scale, but yeah. utility scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And it's just, all we're doing is copying that, that Absolutely. map that you laid yeah. out. It's, it's harder to do it in the real world, in the commercial world, it, right? It um, needs a lot of money. Yeah, it does need a lot of money. And you know, people have this tendency, oh, it's easy to start a business. And it's easier to start an IT business, easy yeah. to, start, to start a software, like you don't need a lot of money. Nope. But in, in the businesses that we're in, you yeah. know, I've introduced flywheel technology in yeah. the Ontario marketplace. I've compressed air technology yeah. into the Ontario marketplace, battery technology. And, yeah. and they were small pilots, but now we're to the point where we're big and commercial and we're introducing a 250 megawatt, exactly. 1000 megawatt hour battery installation on the grid in Ontario. It's yeah. amazing. Huh? And, that, and that process that you went through with Enerstore is basically what we're, we're like boot camps yeah, for the are. next Enerstores. You are. Right? But in, in a whole range of industries that are parallel, yeah. including the thermal energy. Yeah, exactly. So thermal storage yeah. is, it, you know, there's going to be a group of technologies that'll go through our lab yeah. and, and get there, including hydrogen, yeah. right? And so where you've got at least now those capacities on the electrical side, yeah. we're focused on the thermal side. Yeah, exactly. So by getting all those companies to where they need to be yeah. through that, like you say, high capital intensive but, and, but and that's, actually- But that's shared, that shared high capital uh, assets. Uh, facility, assets that yeah. many companies can share. Yeah. That's what's brilliant about what we're that's doing here. That's the difference That's with the that difference. No, we're, everybody's not building the same facility, yeah. right? People are coming here 
they're coming here, aren't they? The yeah. last couple of months. Tell me how many companies oh. want to use this facility. Between the bioreactor and the and the 10x fermenters, there's 20 companies. 20 companies, yeah. and, and they want to come here and work and yeah. live and perhaps build their manufacturing. Yeah. So the idea is then. So so you know why. Why have every company put 1.5 million into their own little thousand litre bioreactor? I yeah. say little, it's big. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, a million and a half is generally their first raise. Yeah. But you don't need the thousand when, when you've run it, you need to get to 10,000 and then you need to get 100,000. Yeah. And so that's capital efficient. Yeah. If we are the ones who put the million and a half into that, yes. and then maybe we put the next 10 million into the 10X. Yeah. Now, not every company that, that would have spent that 10 to 15 million yeah. is going to spend it anymore. No. They can all use this facility. It's a fraction of the cost of development to commercialization. Exactly. That and is now, key. when they get to, and this is the same on the energy side, when they get to being big enough to drop in yeah. to the grid or the manufacturing plant, yeah. They're actually, that IP that got developed way back yeah. there is now worth way much more money yeah. and it's going to stay in Canada. Yeah. Isn't, so, it, isn't it magic, isn't it magic, Beth, when government, business, and science come together mm -hmm. and really, you know, this is the way to make things happen. Yeah. You know, the silos have to go. Mm -hmm. The silos are going, by the way. Yeah. And, and, you know, the Nova Scotia is so blessed with... Oh my God! How many universities do we have? How many, how many immigrants do we bring into this to this province? How many, you know, uh, how many people are wanting to stay? Mm -hmm. When I was young, there was almost no option. I stayed yeah. as long as I could. I stayed for yeah. nine years working in a coal mining company. Yeah. But really, there was an opportunity for me, right? Yeah. And so I had to leave. I stayed close to Cape Breton. Yeah. I always will. And I come back, and this year I have a whole year here, so that's why <laughs> I'm doing this yeah. and having so much fun. But I think that um, uh, the world's their oyster. Nova Scotia, the world is their oyster. Yeah. Who doesn't want to come to live here? We figured out, we managed the pandemic better than probably any other yeah. place in the world. Yeah. Okay. And and we are, you know, we, you know, I, I said that to the premier yesterday. I said, look, you, you have a big opportunity here. Mm -hmm. You really do. You have a clean plate. Yeah. Go for it. And, you know, we have to get off coal. We have to accelerate that. Yeah. We, have to, we have to recognize that this can be one of the most beautiful ecosystems, tourism ecosystems in the world, mm -hmm. right? And, and we, have, we have so much here. Yeah. We have an agriculture opportunity. We have a fishery opportunity. We have a forestry opportunity. Yeah. We have a tourism opportunity. Yeah. And you're playing in three of those. Yeah. And that is just so exciting, Beth. It really is. I, I think the key to your point is... We're not displacing primary industry, we're adding that value yep. to primary industry. Yep. So we still value our forestry. Yes. But if we need to be having more diversity of, of forest resource, you know, yep. back, back to the biodiversity, then we need a diversity of uh, options for landowners yep. to sell into. Absolutely. You know, I mean, <laughs> strange enough, it takes me back to selling pigs yep. to market. Yep. If you just have one outlet, you don't determine your destiny and you don't determine your price. Yep. If you have a range of market options, so, you know, yes, there's, there's lumber, there's pulp, but now there's biographene, yep. there, there's bioenergy, yep. there's all of those, you know, dropping fuels. You can then take, okay, well, here's my, I'm a, you know, a forestry lot owner, and there's all my markets. Now I can actually make my business more cost effective because those third party, as I call them, intermediary companies exist yeah. and the key is it, there's going to be lots of those instead of one one big big market. primary industry Absolutely. yeah it's it, it look we have got to give back to the planet what we're taking we are not in any way in 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 and and i'll tell you we're at a we're at a crossroads as a as a as a planet as a country as a as a citizen and if we don't start accelerating this, and, and the timing of what you're doing, Beth, is perfect. It really is. Let's go to the future. Beth, what does this place look like? Tell me your image of what, what the Verschuren Center could create over the next five and ten years. I think we're going to bud. You're going to be like a yeast. We're yes. going to bud. Yes. And there's going to be Verschuren Centers 
across Canada. Yep. Because I honestly believe this business model that we've created yes. to get those new generation of companies commercialized yep. is what's needed across the country. Yep. So here we're gonna we're gonna 10x everything we yep. do for Would those you, companies to make the next step. So 10x. So today you have a biorefining unit here that's a thousand liters, yeah. right? So you're going to build ten thousand. Yep. So those are big tanks, man. Oh, yeah. That's oh, yeah. a big tank over there. We need this space yep. again. Yeah. They'll go to the roof and they would fill this building. Yeah. That would just be the tanks, yeah. not nothing else, not yeah. downstream. Yeah. And then we'll 10x our energy lab. So instead of one megawatt units, then we'll start, we'll move up to 10 megawatts on the thermal side, yeah. right? Uh, and, and so that would be here. Yeah. So that's then the next stage of growth for all those companies. Yeah. Their next one will be, you'll, you'll find uh, that there's sufficient numbers of them that, that you then have the logistical sense of having a business development yeah. park. Yeah. And that will business be a natural products park yeah. of all kinds of things. So yeah. that you get the synergies of energy use, yeah. of transportation, logistics, yeah. ingredient supply. But then you, you know, we're in Nova Scotia. We've yeah. got Europe on our doorstep. I know we do. We're four so, hour so time zone away. It's amazing. The critical mass yeah. of companies exiting here. Yeah. We'll, we'll co-locate yeah. because that's the key to the next step yeah. and then they'll export. So Beth, do you see, do you see people you know, staying in Nova Scotia too? Do you see a lot of this yeah. activity staying in Cape Breton and, yeah. and, and, and parts of Nova so Scotia? So you and I talk often about the young people and, and they are the future. Yeah. They are coming with, with all those brainiac tools that are way beyond anything I understand. Um, but but they need that business help, right? But they're going to create smart businesses. We're going to have businesses that are, you know, the, <laughs> these guys are incredible. So, you know, you, you think, well, we're just okay. We're just doing fermentation, right? But well, no, actually we're going to model it. And, and it, it's, it's so funny because it's almost like going back to, you know, my PhD was simulation modeling. Now we have all the tools to do that like this. We got AI, we got machine learning. So instead of us only being fermentation and having synthetic biology, which is awesome in itself, we've also got machine learning. So you can predict what that machine's going to do. So instead of doing 20 runs, you could probably do five runs, and then you know what, how your system runs when you want to scale it up to 10x and 100,000 and all of those things. So these guys are smart. Um, they're going to take all those science technologies, the IT, the machine learning, they're going to merge them together, yeah. and, and they'll probably have a lifestyle where they can be here. In fact, they could probably be in Halifax or they could be up in Inganish running that machine yeah. and that's that that's what they're going to have i mean i remember when i was younger people used to say yeah you know technology's coming and we're all going to have a four-day work week well i don't know where that went because yeah. i need an eight day right now <laughs> and i know you do that you know so I, and and i feel like our kids like for the future our kids look at us and i, I used to say this to you like with with my farming clients in the prairies their kids look at them and go, you're mad. I don't, I don't want to work 24 seven. You know, I'm pretty yeah. sure mine look at me and they think, yeah, I don't want to be like you, mom. No. You're great, but. No, they're going to have more balanced life. But they're going to be able to yeah. have a balanced yeah. life because they can use those technologies that yeah. have evolved in the last 10 years. And that's yeah. why I say, you were ahead of the curve. Mm. You could see where the future economy needed to be from here. Yep. Nobody yep. else understood it back then. Yeah. Well, I understand markets, right? I, you know, and my experience with Home Depot and Michaels, and, yeah. and I, I get where the market's going. And uh, I even saw back when I was running Home Depot, people were very interested, energy efficiency, yeah. the water, the air. Yeah. And so we developed this eco options program yeah. that really was very successful. And so this has been uh, something that, you know, one of my oil and gas buddies says, and that you're like the canary in the in the mine you really have you, yeah. you you you've been talking about this for for 20 years and yeah. and i think you know it's 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 from the legacy of where i grew up on a farm in here in cape breton you know working in the coal mining yeah. industry eventually being on the board to close that coal mine yeah. and that was very difficult but the opportunity on this island as a result of all those big absentee owner closures has allowed the people of this island mm -hmm. to uh, 
uh, to show their strength. And we are attracting people like you. Yeah. And thank you for coming here. Thank you for being part of, of what I believe is going to be a renaissance of Cape Breton. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just am so excited about the future. I am hanging out with a lot of young people. Cape Breton Voices. <laughs> Beth is a member of Cape Breton Voices. Yeah. Like Amanda, I, I yeah. interviewed Amanda the other day. And we women, men, it's uh, quite frightening in terms of what we see the potential to be. And you know what? We keep looking forward, Beth. Yeah. That's the, that's the yeah. thing. We don't care about the past. We yeah. want to move forward. And if you stay focused on moving forward, yeah. uh, we can be and do anything we want. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for the contribution you're making to Cape Breton, to Nova Scotia, to Canada, and to the world. You are special. Thank you, because you're our inspiration. And I, I know Amanda said that too. The voices have been amazing. Um, it's a support system that we all need. Yes. Everyone's of those, they're building businesses yep. and you need help, yep. you know? Yep. And I think that's the thing that, that, you know, certainly you've taught me is we've got to think bigger. Yep. If, if you leave with any message, it's think bigger than you think you can achieve. Absolutely. Like, I had no idea we could do what we're doing now. <laughs> and you push that. That's right. <laughs> You're the one who yeah. keeps pushing me, dragging me up when I'm down, and saying, you know, that's where you're going. It's yeah. not that we don't care about the past. No, no. And it's not that the past isn't important, but we've got to live in the future. Yeah. And we have to create the future. And yeah. we create our own destiny. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, one of those things that you bring all the time. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. For being who you are. Thank <laughs> you.